Hello and welcome. I'm Paul Kilmer, Director of Public Programs at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us for the debut of the museum's Equity in the Built Environment series, conversations that focus on how buildings, landscapes, interiors, and streets can be the cause of, and more important, a cure for social and racial disparities. This speaker series is meant to offer new learning opportunities for our audiences, new moments for professional growth and exposure, and in general, greater understanding about the power of the built environment. It's a chance for us to see how inequity and injustice are built into our communities, knowingly or not. This series is dedicated to learning truths that many of us haven't previously known, have ignored, or perhaps have willfully disregarded. But it is also rooted in the belief that design for everyone plays a vital role in making our world a more equitable place. In this series, the museum offers a safe place for dialogue to take place. We acknowledge that some of the conversations will be difficult and painful, and we sincerely thank in advance all those who will participate. And we encourage you, the viewer, to be just as involved in the conversation as our panelists. You can submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our very best to get it answered in the time we have together. Speaking of time, we understand that the enormity of these issues can't possibly be fully discussed in the time we have together in this one program. We understand that everyone is grappling with issues of social justice, equity, and so much more at different speeds. So is the museum, which sees these conversations as a way for us to learn about how we can be more inclusive in the stories that we tell through our exhibitions, the programs we present, and the experiences our visitors have in our physical building. We have a lot to catch up on. To help us get started, I'm very happy to introduce Lisa Jennings. Lisa is the Manager of Career Discovery and Diversity at the American Society of Landscape Architects, also known as ASLA, an organization that re represents and advocates for the landscape architecture profession. ASLA has been a longtime supporter of the museum in our exhibitions and through family and adult programs. We continue to be grateful for ASA, ASLA's long-going support. ASLA's diversity and equity statement following the murder of George Floyd was one of the inspirations for this series. So I'm looking forward to our continuing work with Lisa and her colleagues on this additional layer of collaboration. For now though, please welcome Lisa Jennings. Good evening. Um, ASLA is thrilled to be partnering with the National Building Museum on this exciting lecture series. And we're especially pleased to be leading with our member colleagues from the Black Landscape Architects Network. ASLA and the National Building Museum have had a remarkably powerful relationship as co-leaders in the built environment community that has spanned more than 10 years. So we are honored that ASLA was chosen to kick off this important series. Before I introduce our moderator, um, I wanna make sure that our attendees know about ASLA's work and available resources on our diversity, equity, inclusion, and racial injustice in the profession. We are working harder now more than any time in the association's history to be representative and reflective of all the communities we serve, specifically through our career discovery and diversity programming. And we're doing so now in a way that reckons with the history of this profession while honoring underrepresented and also neglected communities. ASLA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Hub, the website on the page, is the one place where you can learn about the full scope of our efforts from ASLA leadership through our mission, vision, and values to our members who are hard at work in the professional practice networks, in their firms, and academic institutions. We highlight best practices in the hub, along with the grassroots work we've done at ASLA headquarters and through local and national partnerships with educator communities. Finally, all of these highlights are captured and portrayed through uh, very engaging and exciting stories in leading publications, such as The Dirt, 
the field, and the landscape architecture magazine. I invite you to visit our hub to learn more and get involved. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Mrs. Ujiji Davis-Williams, ASLA member and Black Land member. Based in Detroit, Michigan, Ujiji Davis-Williams is a practicing landscape architect and urban planner who focuses on landscape and urban design, master planning and strategic implementation. She's currently an associate at Smith Group and an adjunct professor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Architecture. Burgeoning as a researcher, Ujiji explores the intersection between landscape, place, and racial identity, as well as the responsibilities of landscape architecture for historic reconciliation through design. Ujiji. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I really do appreciate that introduction, and I'm really excited about this partnership uh, that we have with ASLA. National Building uh, Museum, and I'm really excited for this series. So I am elated that there are so many people here to share in uh, the inaugural session, um, Equity in the Built Environment. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce our, our, our panelists. Um, I will start with um, Dr. Austin Allen. Uh, who is an associate professor of practice at the School of Architecture at the University of Texas, Arlington. He is also uh, a member of ASLA, as well as a board member of Black uh, Landscape Architects Network. So thank you uh, and welcome. Uh, next, we are also uh, introducing uh, Chief Tyrone Casby, um, who is a retired uh, formal principal of Landry High School in New Orleans, um, but an honored chief in the uh, Mardi Gras Indian Cultural Society. And last but not least, uh, Matt Williams. Uh, Matt Williams is a landscape designer, urban planner who currently works for the city of Detroit. Um, and um, all of these uh, people together have worked together in New Orleans um, around the topic that we're going to be discussing today around the Mardi Gras Indian Cultural Campus. Um, so welcome and thank you for being here. So uh, to kick it off, <laughs> I, have, I have a couple of questions, but I would like to direct my first question to Chief Casby. Um, a lot of people do not know much about the Mardi Gras Indian uh, Council, so I would very much like it if you could give us a brief history on the Mardi Gras Indians. Um, what does the culture mean uh, to you? What does the culture mean to, to New Orleans? And, um, and what can we kind of learn in, in a brief moment about about uh, this culture here? Well, first of all, thank you guys for reaching out to the council and to the campus to find out basically who and what we are in New Orleans. Um, the Mardi Gras Indians in itself is a culture, an African culture that has entwined itself into a European tradition, which uses a, a Native American's facade to exhibit that. And what I mean by that is the New Orleans Mardi Gras Indians are young black African men who dressed up in Native American regalia and paraded through the streets of New Orleans on Mardi Gras. Uh, of course, you know, in Mardi Gras in New Orleans, uh, during the time of segregation, Blacks weren't allowed to participate in the Mardi Gras as you know it. So in the back streets of New Orleans, we performed our own Mardi Gras. And for part of the history, in order to answer the facade of asking behind the Indian facade, Blacks in slavery weren't allowed to do a lot of things. And as we were coming out post I guess you say reconstruction and Mardi Gras, we became entwined into the African American and Native American culture because of slavery, because of the escape of slaves into the swamps of New Orleans, Louisiana. And from that, that particular facade came out. So in order for Africans to express who they were, they used the Native American facade. They dressed up as Native Americans. And sometimes you hear people say that, we do that to pay homage to the Native Americans for helping us during slavery. But in actuality, that was our only way of expressing who we were behind that mask. And there's a place in New Orleans called Congo Square. And at Congo Square, slaves were allowed to congregate to actually sing their chants, sing their songs, because of the French rule at the time. And the French, which was kind of lenient during slavery, allowed them to do that. So as we fast forward that to Mardi Gras, we were in the back streets of New Orleans, dressed up in Native American regalia. And eventually, we started expressing ourselves and dancing and singing and 
what have you. And from that, not only now do we dress up in Native American regalia, but we also express our own Afrocentric beading and sewing and what have you. And what I mean by that is every year we make a new costume. And like I said, it takes a lot of time to tell you the whole story, but we dress up in Native American and African American costumes and parades through the whole streets of New Orleans because now what was a back street hideaway now is in the mainstream of America, of the world. Because individuals come from all around the world to see the Mardi Gras Indians. And remember the word Mardi Gras is only placed on it because of doing this uh, Lenten season in New Orleans. That's when we actually uh, perform or have our regalia on. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is that we all know that history, it hurts, but you know it also can heal. So from that history, which I mentioned in the fact of the uh, Native American, the African American slavery, from that, you now have one of the most premier uh, activities that takes place here in the city of New Orleans during the Mardi Gras in the Lenten season. And individuals come from all over the world. And we perform on different venues now. At one time, we performed only in our communities. Now we'll go around the world, as far as Sri Lanka, Dubai, uh, Honduras. And when you go to those places, you see the same activity taking place, which tells you that it's bigger than just guys dressed up in Native American costumes, dancing and singing through the streets. This is a very deep African-American culture, like I said in the beginning, that is a part of a European tradition that is exhibited to a Native American uh, garb. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it does, thank you. Sure. Very informative, thank you so much. And it's, it's very interesting to understand all of the different ways in which um, uh, Black and African American peoples have been able to preserve their culture um, even under the guise of something else um, to, to continue to protect. Um, so thank you for sharing that legacy. Um, my next question is to uh, Dr. Allen. Um, so how did you connect it to Chief Caspi? I'd love to hear about your, your story and how you got connected to the Mardi Gras Indians as well. Um, what were you doing at the time and, and, and how did, you, how did the, your goals or, or, or vision align um, in, in meeting? Well, uh, the story, uh, for this part of the story at least, uh, starts about 2013. And uh, what happened was uh, part of a design firm, uh, Design Jones, and we were part of the Livable Claiborne study that was going on, Livable uh, Communities. And one of the things that came out of that was this idea that the community uh, organizations had to have more input on what was going to happen in these livable Claiborne communities in New Orleans. And um, one of the organizations that was actually suggested by uh, Jacques Morial was that the Mardi Gras Indians Council uh, be included in that discussion. We had on, and I, I have the dates of it, June 15th and June 30th, of 2013 met at A.L. Davis Park or Shakespeare Park as it's called in certain circles, uh, still called Shakespeare in certain circles, but A.L. Davis Park uh, in the recreation center there. We were packed meetings both of those days and uh, the Mardi Gras Indians came from uptown, downtown and met with city officials and met with other people and um, really began to talk about their impact on the culture and the importance that uh, the Mardi Gras Indians had on New Orleans culture and thus the New Orleans economy. And uh, the importance of having that be part of a discussion on any kind of future development that would happen in the city. Uh, out of that uh, uh, set of meetings came a promise that's, that something would happen in the future in terms of it. Um, I, at the time I was teaching at uh, Louisiana State University and uh, wanted to, you know, see that we could see something carry out with that. And so I involved graduate students on my end uh, to try and figure out how we could take that challenge and move it forward. Uh, there was another person, Maurice Cox, who at that point was at Tulane University, and uh, he did the same with the uh, 
the uh, community development center that they had um, now called the small center. And um, th between the two of us, we went after funding to actually make this a, a, you know, a reality between the students and the Mardi Gras Indian Council. We sat down and began to have a dialogue, a serious dialogue about how we could actually do something that empowered and not something that just, you know, was a flash by in terms of this. And so that started uh, the journey, if you will, and um, in, involved uh, many people in starting to have a dialogue that ended up with the idea that there had to be a physical representation that stayed in place of the Mardi Gras Indians. One of the things I love about the Mardi Gras Indians is that everybody in New Orleans knows the Mardi Gras Indians. It's not like uh, something off to the side. But one of the things is that the Mardi Gras Indians have always defined the Mardi Gras Indians uh, at the end of the day, you know, and that it's a powerful statement that has made them the keepers of the culture, the keepers of so much of the uh, of the way we think about New Orleans and thus became extremely important. I remember there was a exercise going on with the city and they wanted to map the pathways and this is no small thing. They wanted to say, they're gonna turn down this street and then turn down this street and then turn down this street. And if you wanna see them, that's it. And that was a total misunderstanding going on of the Mardi Gras Indians, which is the pathways belong to the Mardi Gras Indians. And that's part of the ritual itself is whole neighborhoods who claim the Mardi Gras Indians, you know, they're guessing every day that Mardi Gras Indians are gonna appear, they're guessing, will they appear today? And will they go down this street? Well, they, that's the part of the importance of that ritual because in the end of the day, the Mardi Gras Indians claim the city and you know the city claims them, so. Right, thank you. That's, that's such a beautiful uh, way of putting it. I think that, uh, you know, Place making in itself is one of the things that is is, is dynamic, and uh, we, I think, as as designers, are very much interested in how do we kind of create a space in which culture happens um, without also acknowledging and understanding that culture is something that evolves and continues to grow and manifest and change over time, um, even though the core of it stays the same. Um, so thank you for putting that uh, rather beautifully. Uh, my third question is to Matt Williams. Um, what was your role with the Mardi Gras Indian Council, um, knowing that you are connected to uh, this culture as well and to this project, um, but really also wanting to understand from your perspective, what was so important about this project to you that you committed yourself to be invested? Well, as you know, I'll, I'll first say thank you uh, to the panel and to the National Building Museum and to ASLA and Blackland for providing this platform uh, for this discussion um, about equity in the built environment. Um, I, my involvement to uh, echo uh, Dr. Allen's comments uh, was initially as a graduate student. Uh, I was attending Louisiana State University and I had the uh, job at the time, if you will, to be the assistant manager for the C by C studio, this digital equipment laboratory of all the digital cameras and 3D scanners and all the fun uh, technology we design students like to play with. This technical background in, in, in in camera setups and learning how to shoot. And uh, Dr. Allen came to me and asked uh, if I would help participate in his, his, his studio course as an independent study of my own uh, to be the director of photography for a series of interviews that they were gonna be doing with Mardi Gras Indians. And I'm not from New Orleans, and so unlike everybody else in New Orleans who already knew everything about Mardi Gras Indians, I was pretty new to it. I, I hadn't really 
grasp how deep this culture is really embedded in the streets in New Orleans. Um, but then the series of interviews started and uh, one by one, the chiefs allowed me and a small crew of uh, graduate and undergraduate students from both LSU and Tulane to come into their homes, ask them a bunch of questions about what they do and why they sell these suits. And very quickly it became obvious to me uh, what I was getting myself involved with in terms of very rich history in the city of New Orleans. Um, my next role, uh, after graduating from LSU and, and sort of doing the video piece of things, was as a fellow with the Tulane City Center located in New Orleans, not too far from where their current Mardi Gras Indian cultural campus is now. And my work at that time was to start to organize some of that footage we'd already shot into a digital archive and work alongside other designers to start to pr prepare preliminary drawings about what a physical site might actually look like. Um, and then that merged and evolved into uh, a sizable grant from Art Place America in 2015. We wrote a half million dollar grant uh, with the Marty, Marty Grand Indian Council. Uh, and we could then in earnest begin sort of the process of developing what is now the Mardi Gras Indian Cultural Campus. So my role sort of evolved uh, over time and in contiguous years from I think 2014 to uh, 2020 when the campus was, was official. And, and I still get emails, but uh, I think to, to be a part of something so important to the city of New Orleans, to black people in the city of New Orleans, to our history, to our culture. Um, it was not lost on me very early in the process and working with Austin Allen and Chief Casby and Bertrand Butler of the Marty Bryanian Council and all the other chiefs of the council. Uh, I really saw these men as leaders in their community and who I would want to aspire to be in my own community. I mean, they had the juice. They got guys who can get it done for you when they call. And they say, yes, sir, when they call. And, you know, they command the, 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 the sense of respect they command when they walk into the room. And when they start to sing Indian Red, I don't know any of the lyrics, but I feel it in my soul. It's the, the rhythm of the place is undeniable. And if it means anything to you, it catches you kind of immediately. And I, I was caught hooked by a singer, so. Um, I wanted to be a part of preserving that culture and doing it with uh, a physical structure is, is sort of my training as a designer. So I can lend that talent as well as some of my business background to help project manage and sort of guide things along the way. Great, thank you for that. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to hear um, just also where the a visceral reaction to preserving culture, how that then also begins to manifest as part of a, a strategic action as well. Um, to the viewers that are here, um, I'd like to, at this moment, encourage questions that you might have. Um, I still have a few of my own, but we would definitely love to hear from the audience, um, especially as uh, I know that there are uh, quite so many people that um, don't know very much about uh, the Indian Council, the culture here. Um, this is really an opportunity to engage, uh, to learn, and also to tap uh, the speakers that we have here in, in learning about how do you uh, do the cultural preservation around a very nuanced and a very, uh, a very important local cultural um, facet. Um, so please populate our Q&A box or the chat box, um, whichever options that you see below, um, and we will um, have those questions uh, ready at the second half of our segment. But before we get there, the question that I have to the group, uh, the image that we have up right now is of uh, the two buildings that are part of the campus. Um, and I'll open this up to the group. Can you share just a little bit about the process um, behind establishing the campus? Um, I guess, what were some of the goals in, in establishing this, th these particular buildings? And then also, please let us know what were some of the obstacles? Um, what were some of the challenges in, in, in executing and realizing uh, the campus and this project? If, if I can, I, I, I just would like to start with uh, a, a short story. And I, I 
told it before. Um, we were walking down the streets. There would be uh, the Tulane professor, uh, Maurice Cox, myself, Bertrand Butler, who is the uh, director and representative of the uh, Mardi Gras Indian Council on that level, and uh, a number of other officials and people. And we were walking down the street, and we had got about a block and a half away from this location. And uh, a number of people were suggesting to the Mardi Gras Indians, this is where you want to be. And we walked more and walked more. And uh, finally, somebody turned to Bertrand, who's representing the Mardi Gras Indian Council, and says, if you had a choice, where would you choose? And this, he pointed to this, and he said, we'll have our eyes on the park. And that was it. <laughs> and that's the story. <laughs> And that's a good story, Austin, because it's true. And when you look at those buildings, those were really dilapidated, unutilized buildings just sitting in a community going unused. But one of the most significant things about this particular area was eyes on the park. Across from these two buildings is a park where a lot of civil rights activities took place. On the corner, if you're looking at the picture straight up to the left is where uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and SNLC started. Southern Leadership Conference was organized, New Zion Church. So really the neighborhood itself is a neighborhood where a lot of new activities were beginning to happen. And so we felt that if we're gonna be anywhere, let's be in Central City. Not on the West Bank where I live, Maddie, the best bank, but in the uh, heart of New Orleans where everyone could have the opportunity to come by and actually see the campus and what we have to offer from a Mardi Gras Indian perspective. Great, Matt. Do you have anything? Yeah, to add? I was I was clicking around, clicking around, trying to join in. Sorry. Uh, so I think, in terms of making the uh, campus feel like something um, both unique to the New Orleans Mardi Gras Indian Council, but also uh, natural and embedded in the New Orleans community in the Central City where it is located. Um, and being something of the stature that would live next to the other landmarks like New Zion Baptist Church and the historic A.L. Davis Park, formerly known as Shakespeare Park, and the Lafon Burial Grounds, and uh, side of the former town school, which is uh, you know a black school in the, in the city of New Orleans. I think it was important for um, uh, us as designers, I think, if you will, to be able to try to. Um, stay native to the language of, of Central City, but also introduce those modern elements that would allow the New Orleans Mardi Gras Indians to have a 21st century feel. And so if you were to go inside the campus, and I think the National Building Museum has made some pictures of the interior of the campus available via their website, uh, you'll see that there's a media room, there's a sewing room, there are uh, Mardi Gras Indian suits on display, but there's also a council boardroom where decisions can be made on how to take the uh, council and also the culture forward and into the future. So uh, a very modern interior with a uh, very sort of New Orleans still feel to the outside of the space. We were also, and I, I think I, I must give credit to uh, a good friend of mine who uh, has played a large hand in development of the campus. His name is Michael Farley. Uh, he has uh, bent over backwards, turned left and right, looked under every stone and, and rock partners and ways to enhance uh, this property. Uh, he's partnered with Tulane on a number of things, but most notably in the yard next door, there's a community garden uh, where actively young people and members of the neighborhood come and, and, and uh, are able to plot in that, excuse me, plant in that garden. And so activating the space in the way that was still accessible to people who live there, but also people who don't live uh, there who can come and more about the culture, I think was another important goal. The challenge, um, or one of the challenges, however, uh, is to make the New Orleans Mardi Gras Indian Council cultural campus a space where all Mardi Gras Indians, uptown, downtown, 
you know, West Bank, Best Bank, <laughs> uh, to feel home and to feel welcome to, to uh, you know, uh, be able to preserve the culture. Um, and I think there, if, if you would ask any Mardi Gras Indian, I mean, part of the culture is historically been, um, uh, you know, at times adversarial between different tribes. And so I think the campus is unique in a way. It's, it's, it's a different future for the Mardi Gras Indian culture as a whole and where we're trying to identify places where we come together and build the culture together. Great. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to maybe reiterate my question. I, I think that you guys have definitely talked about the, the strengths and, um, and and some of the successes on how this came together. Um, but I think one of the critical elements is also really understanding some of the challenges um, and obstacles. Um, so I just guess kind of want to just understand just a, a light pulse of what were some of the things that um, were, were, were obstacles in establishing this as, as a place um, uh, from, you know, I know we, we have identified where the site was, but I'd love to hear about what, what were some of the, the elements that maybe slowed down the process. Well, the number one element, and I can answer that, would be funding. <laughs> you know, we were a group, uh, we're in the group of individuals who have various tribes within the city, approximately 28, and we didn't have the wherewithal to purchase buildings of that statue or to purchase property to, you know, to move forward with it. Uh, you have to go to the city, you have to go to, hopefully someone gives you some funding. So as Maddie pointed out, we had a couple of guys like Mr. Butler and Mr. Farley, who was a director and assistant director of the campus, they actually were recruiting, you know, hustling. I don't use the word hustling, but trying to get funding from various individuals. And once the individuals saw what we were doing, the city, as well as some uh, private vendors, they say, you know what, this is something I need to be a part of. And we have received funding from various groups now because they see that this culture is bigger than, as I pointed out earlier, a group of guys dressing up, going through the streets and enjoying Mardi Gras. It's a hidden culture that no one knew about. And now that it's coming to the forefront, individuals want to be a part of it and actually help us, you know, bring this out further. So funding was the major obstacle. Anything else in between that would be political, and there's a couple lots next to the building that we're trying to get, but there's some politics involved. But as far as the campus, the two campus buildings that we have, thanks to Arts Place, I must say, they came forward and they have, uh, you know, invested in us. And now they see the fruition of what actually is going on with their funding. Because, you know, no one want to give money to a group of guys who don't own anything other than their Mighty Guardian Indian costumes and say, you know, hey, look, I'm going to give you this half million dollars. Do what you like. Because when you talk about a culture of individuals, some folks would even think that that money was going to that individual. So when the campus came about, now as Maddie pointed out, individuals who didn't want to be a part of the council say, oh, these guys are actually moving. Oh, the city says these guys are doing things that are real you know, productive. So now it's working. So I think the biggest obstacle for us at that time was funding and today, because <laughs> we want to move forward and get bigger. I, I, I also say there was a transition going on of the way that the Mardi Gras Indians were being perceived politically because, and Chief, you can speak to this better than, than, than I can, that it was seen as outsiders and, and in a very negative way and it ended up being the death of, of, of you know, um, chief you know to the montana and then you know things that happened from there that moved and progressed to make this such a better experience and to move it in a whole new direction and i'd love to hear you talk about that because i think this was really the, that was an obstacle at one point because the city nor the police department accepted the monic by indian culture or people of color they did not they didn't accept us as to who I just mentioned we were. We're African men expressing a European culture behind a Native American mask. So they would suppress us. If we would come out, and Austin pointed out, if we say we mask on Mardi Gras Day, uh, the police would run us off the street. As the audience in the city of New Orleans that said, Mardi Gras starts at five in the morning and ends at midnight. In the African American community, it started at five in the morning because they wanted us in the street it had to be off the street by 6 p.m. that evening. However, in Main Street, New Orleans, Carnival and Mardi Gras went on until midnight. 
And until 2013, uh, one of the council person realized that and put an audience in place to say, you know what? These guys can master at midnight also. And the police would really suppress us. And he mentioned Tootie Montana. He's one of the great chiefs that we had in the city over one of our particular tribes. And because of this suppression that took place on one St. Joseph night, which we masked, and I can get into that later, but we were run off the street and we went to the city council with a concern. And at the podium, as he was expressing to them, and he was 80 something years old, that he's tired of being suppressed. And he died at the podium. So that was July 2005. And of course, we all know what happened in except, uh, August 2005. Here comes Katrina. And when Hurricane Katrina came, everyone thought the Mardi Gras Indian culture was non void, gone away. But we raised up, we came back. And because we were so strong and, and resilient, the city of New Orleans, with the mayor at the time was uh, Moon Landrew, he embraced the native, the Mardi Gras Indian culture because he knew the economic impact that we had, how folks came from all over the world to see us. So from that, uh, to answer your question, or just add on to what uh, Austin said, yes, we were being suppressed and we came out of that and we're still going strong and we're gonna get even stronger. Right on, right on. Um, so I actually have a, a bunch of questions coming in. So I'm going to open it up a little bit to the Q&A. I think I have a closing question at the end that I do think can wait because there are some really great questions here. Um, first question, what role uh, to do Black women play um, in the Mardi Gras Indian Council? Or is this more of a fraternity? It's not a fraternity. It's an organization of chiefs. And remember I pointed out there were approximately 28 tribes in the city, what we call masking tribes. And the organization or the, the council came about because of conflict. Austin alluded to it earlier. There were conflict among tribes. So the chiefs got together, 13 chiefs got together and said, hey guys, we got to stop this. Because if we continue to let, we suppress it and then the outsiders suppressing it, it's going to go away. You may hear the terminology as I speak. I talk about tribe, I talk about a gang. Well, in the earlier days, folks were calling gangs because they thought that there was a bunch of guys dressed up starting trouble. So if your parent thought you was going to gang, then they wouldn't let you be a part of it. And eventually it would go away. So that's one side of it. The other piece is that when you talk about women being involved, yes, they are very much involved. I mean, I can't run my house without my wife. <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, yes, women are involved. They're not a part of the council board. They're not a part of the, the council as we know it, but they are the queens. They're in, a, in the culture itself, they're called queens and they have their role. And their role is to help chiefs maintain the tribe, you know, keep order with the younger children because we do have children involved. And some uh, queens do so. They so for their husband, they so for other gang members so that the culture can continue to grow. So yes, women are very much involved in, in the culture. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. Uh, as we talk about the youth, um, can you describe uh, just how how was how was the, the the how was the passing down of this tradition done typically? Is it you know you're kind of born into the culture, um, or is it is it is it solely from a from a neighborhood perspective, um, how do how do you pass down some of these traditions to the the younger generations um, to help to preserve the culture? What are some of the programming that you guys offer? Well, we offer sewing classes. We also have what we call Indian practices, where kids are involved to the practices. For me, example, uh, I've been in this business almost fifty plus years. I've been master chief for thirty seven years. So, what captured my spirit were the drum beats. I had an older brother who was involved. And I heard the drums at four years old. So it caught my soul. It caught my passion. And that's why I move on. Uh, a lot of guys who are involved in the culture from various tribes have different reasons as to why they join. But, you know, you can't join a culture. It's in you. It's just what, can, what is done to bring that out of you. But my kids, being around their father, they saw what I was doing, not only in the tribe, but in the community. You know, um, I was, uh, what you say, a respected person because of a chief. I became chief in 1980, based upon the fact that I was respected, based upon the fact that I could sing, based upon the fact that I like to dance. So I just have fun. And young children see that. And when they see you having fun, they want to be a part of it. 
And it's very positive that you have the positivity that you have to put out there so they want to be a part of it. Like I said earlier, folks will put negativism on it, and what happens? Nobody want to be a part. My kids have been masking since they were four years old. I didn't force it on them. They saw their dad. They wanted to be a part of it. My oldest son is 45. My next son is 42. So and I have a daughter, of course, who's 35. And then my grandkids, they see their grandfather. And I'm more sure that takes place in other households throughout the city. And that's how individuals became a part of it. And sometimes the youth, and I'm glad you pointed that out, because if they don't get it earlier, they look at it from a wrong way. See, some guys look at it from the point of, I'm a chief, and make a big old suit. And then they walk down the street by themselves and say they're a chief. And I always say, you're a chief of what? Well, you try. If you're not appointed by your community and your community doesn't respect you, you're just a guy dressed up in a Native American, I mean, an, an African American in a Native American suit who walks through the streets for Mardi Gras, because you're a Mardi Gras Indian. Another question we have coming through is a three-part question, so I'll try to break it down. Have you, um, or as part of a, a partnership with the local schools, has there been any uh, tracing back um, uh, related to the origins of, of, the, the, of the African culture to, to the motherland? Has, has any of that uh, research been done? Okay, there have been research. There's a lot of research out there. Uh, Tulane did a research through the Amstead, uh, use, uh, Amstead Center. They did a lot of research. I personally have done some research so that when I mention the fact that it's an African culture, then I'm talking about African sensitivity. Because for me, the drum beats, I mean, it just costs my soul. So I could talk about me, but from a perspective of um, history, research, it documents the fact that we were enslaved. We know that. We brought our culture here. It was suppressed. And how do we bring it out? Through the Mardi Gras Indians. This is the only place in the United States where this activity actually takes place. Uh, we're all aware of the fact that in the early 1800s, that drum beats weren't allowed beyond the Mason-Dixon line because of lines of communication. You know, that's research that's out there. There's research that shows that, well, we all know, and I'm just speaking for me, that what we know is humanity started in Africa. And if there's a lot of research out there on that, and I haven't done it all, but now that I'm retired, I will be doing some more. But I know <laughs> it's tied into the African culture more than it is the fact that we are paying homage to Native Americans dressed up like Indians just to you know, express who we are. Right. I, I wanted to add to that too. There, there's a couple scholars who I had my students uh, spend some time looking at and uh, their works and talking with them. And uh, one of them is Dr. Joyce, Jackson up at LSU and, and she's still there um, and she goes to Haiti a lot and shows that connection in um, very strong connection to Haiti as well that uh, is tied into the culture and then um, uh, in New Orleans um, got a lot from uh, Brenda Marie Osby the po uh, poet laureate uh, in New Orleans there uh, who has also shared a lot Another question is related to uh, the pandemic. Um, so I know a lot of us are responding um, to that, uh, especially uh, from our own personal and public health, uh, but also from a business standpoint. Um, have we seen uh, any dis disruption uh, with uh, how uh, Mardi Gras Indian Council, the functions, the celebrations, um, even obviously the operations of the building, have we seen any upset with that uh, in, in, in light of the pandemic? The pandemic actually hurts us very much because it came right after Mardi Gras. And during the Lenten season, which is the New Orleans Jazz Festival, every festival you could think of in New Orleans was taking place during that time. And the Mardi Gras Indians participates in all those cultures, all those activities rather. Our Super Sundays, if you look at some of the pictures that have been shown, those individuals who come out for Super Sundays, that happens in various parts of the city, uptown, downtown, across the river. So it has hurt us very much. Uh, my particular suit that I sold for this year, 
I only wore it one time. You know, it makes reflects back to 1940s when I wasn't even here when they said you only wore your suit one time because after you wore it, you had to burn it up. But today, we, of course, we maintain our suits. So the pandemic has really hit us very hard. From a financial standpoint, we have, don't have the funding that we would normally get from these different festivals. It, it's gone mm-hmm. away. So we are praying that Mardi Gras does take place and then we could get into the festival season 2021. However, we don't, we're going to continue to, continue to do what we're doing. We're going to continue, to continue to reach out to the various groups who have given us funding individually, not so much to the council itself, but there are various groups who have been reaching out, cultural groups who have reached out to the various chiefs in their tribes and have given them stipends to help them sustain not only their Indian culture, but sustain them through their life because some guys mm-hmm. lost their jobs from the pandemic and they can't make those suits without no money. So at the end of the day, I think uh, it hurt us very, very, it hit the culture very hard, but we're resilient and we'll come through it. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Allen, there's a question here related to um, housing. Are you aware of any housing equity policies that are in place in New Orleans that are specifically around stabilizing indigenous culture or specifically also African-American communities? Uh, I'm aware of some that 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 came off like right after Katrina, the Musicians Village, uh, you know, w- was an effort. And, um, um, you know, I'm not be able to say exactly what efforts have been happening since then. I know that individual nonprofit organizations have been uh, seriously looking at that. And I think the uh, current administration has been, you know, uh, turning a focus, very strong focus in that direction. How far along it is, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to speak as, you know, uh, the, the person in terms of that, but I can always say that, that uh, a lot more can be done because a lot more can be done around affordable housing, period. You know, and um, I think what, one of the things that is shifting and the important thing that's shifting is realizing that without the cultural foundation of New Orleans, you know, it, it really hampers the whole city. You know, uh, it, this is not something that can be just taken lightly. And I, and, and I think that we're coming to that realization in New Orleans every day a lot stronger that that that's the heart and soul of the city uh is its cultural you know foundation a lot more than some of the other kind of ventures that we think may may get us through you know particular economic times i think it is definitely because of the convergence of a lot of things that have happened it is what makes New Orleans, New Orleans, and the important city that it is. Mm-hmm. Okay. Still going through, we got a handful of questions left. Um, this, I'll direct this question to Matt. Um, in part of the design process of identifying the campus and what goes into it, um, were there any techniques or processes that were used to help to kind of uncover um, some of the cultural influences that might have inspired the design of the campus? Um, you know, with the goal being an acknowledgement of, of a full history of, of place Um, Was there anything that was done maybe differently or untraditionally to uh, uh, establish the the campus through design? Sure. I want to start with um, two actually nearby sites that aren't the campus itself, but extend down the South Street to Washington Avenue, the Walk of Fame, which was something uh, my professor and mentor Austin Allen was already working on the New Orleans with with the New Orleans Mardi Gras Council to establish place markers, um, literally in the sidewalk, which would have helped to tell the story that this is Indian territory, this is significant land. Then around the corner and embedded sort of right there in the middle of the Magnolia projects is a square land where 
uh, there used to be a school. The school was raised, uh, and the land fell on in an in the, uh, uh, instance of development trying to happen. What was found were uh, Native Indian burial grounds, and that's uh, what is known as the Lafon burial ground. And this is right around the corner uh, from the campus in Smith in the middle of the Magnolia projects. So this African American culturally rich place, um, the Dew Drop Inn, also on the South Boulevard, was a place where many notable uh, African American musicians would come and play uh, uh, in the city in New Orleans when they couldn't get gigs at other more mainstream or white institutions. Uh, and all of this is along the LaSalle corridor uh, and in this uh, uh, neighborhood. Uh, and so those two sites being nearby uh, and being stories that Austin was already sort of working with uh, the, the, the council to try to mark as territory that was significant to not only Native uh, American, but also African American history. Uh, and then this set of uh, buildings right across the street from A.L. Davis Park, formerly known as Shakespeare Park, which was historically uh, the first black park in the city in New Orleans. Austin, Chief Casby, please help me if, I, if I'm missing the mark on that. So uh, the, the, the entire neighborhood is, is rich in uh, history that made it important for us as designers to consider when then trying to the stories that would live inside of and, and be created inside of these two buildings here. Um, that said, the actual process uh, of designing the building went through several iterations of visioning sessions with the council themselves. Um, and wherever possible, we tried to uh, make sure that the development was done by hands of Mardi Gras Indians. So several of the Mardi Gras Indians uh, were available to help paint the building. Uh, chiefs were available to help paint the building. Uh, uh, suits were donated from various tribes and the council members that are on display right now in the building. Um, and the thought of the programming being something that could, would take some of what happens on the street during Super Sunday or during Broad Day or during uh, St. Joseph's Night and to be able to perform or practice some of those inside were all spatial considerations that we took into uh, the um, JJ, I, I would also like to add something from that other question that you asked me, because I think it's an, it was an important one around housing, that there is, uh, I was going back in my notes, there is a New Orleans tourism and cultural fund that got put in place this summer uh, with the uh, the mayor Latoya Cantrell through her administration. So it is that kind of awareness and uh, shift um, that's important in terms of understanding that the culture is central in terms of New Orleans. I, I just wanted to add that note of the question. Thank you. I, I think that's really helpful for us to kind of understand what are the pieces in, in place that could potentially help us support um, some of these uh, cultural preservation efforts. And, and thank you, Matt, for uh, sharing the process with us. There's actually another question um, directed toward uh, Matt. Um, look, curious to kind of understand your views uh, just in terms of comparing uh, practicing in New Orleans, practicing design in New Orleans versus practicing design in Detroit. Um, and how um, your experience in New Orleans might have influenced uh, your work in the city of Detroit. Oh, I'm so grateful to answer that question. And I would say that uh, I am so indebted to the New Orleans Mardi Gras Indian Council for the experience. I got to uh, learn with cultural leaders firsthand um, in you know, what cultural development was all about. And that certainly informs some of the work I do in the city of Detroit, working for the planning and development department. I'm currently the project manager for the Warrendale Cody Rouge Neighborhood Framework Plan, uh, which is a neighborhood master planning effort um, that's unique to the city in that it's youth centric. So it has sort of a theme to it in the same way that the cultural development that took place in New uh, Orleans with this project did. Difference is it's planning for uh, development to happen across uh, 
five square mile uh, neighborhood versus, you know, a, a, a development that is sort of centric to this block and to this culture, and, you know, to this audience. Uh, that said, there was for me, um, wow, uh, wow, I'm so, I, I want to try to be concise with answering this question, but there are so many different takeaways from my experience in New Orleans that help inform my practice now. First is I want to say the importance of uh, oral history. And I think sometimes oral history is a way to preserve uh, stories of a place that go beyond what we as designers could do in building buildings to house people there or to allow cultural activities to take place there. Mother Nature has this funny way of having her way. And so ultimately that that oral history has a life that will live a little bit longer than any structure that we could possibly design. Uh, and that to me was sort of the, the long-standing takeaway, more than being able to dwell in any of the homes that I, I, I spent time interviewing chiefs in or at A.L. Davis Park, is learning from them the history of Black people firsthand, passed down from generation to generation, sung in songs that I didn't even know the words to but could feel in my soul as they're being sung. I think that to me is uh, an indelible takeaway that now informs some of what we get to do in the neighborhood planning process in uh, Detroit, uh, where young people were introduced to planning firsthand and we uh, introduced them to different members of city government and local uh, organizations and interviewed them. And there goes that skill, that video interviewing skill that uh, my mentor helped train me on uh, coming back to the forefront uh, here in Detroit. Um, I think another way is in understanding how art can be a driver of place. I think I have to give a lot of credit to Art Place America for establishing the type of philanthropy that would allow art to be the driver of placemaking. And I think, uh, you know, fast forward to now, I see some of the same moves being made by uh, Rochelle O'Reilly and our arts and culture and uh, entertainment department here in the city of Detroit and uh, just a number of different cultural placemaking activities within the planning and uh, development department are undertaking um, that really allow the genus Loki, the spirit of the place, to exude in what uh, infrastructural developments then, to, then come and take place. So both of those uh, cities, I think, are, are, are common in their uh, their demo demographics, their way in which water uh, largely surrounds and shapes their environment, um, but also in the way that moving forward, city and uh, local CDO and local art and cultural leaders like New Orleans Mardi Gras Indians uh, can work together to inform what, what, um, uh, what developments take place. Great, thank you. Um, and with that, I think that is our last question. I do recognize that there are a couple of thing, items in the chat, but uh, we do want to respect all of our time here. Um, uh, just before I kind of close out 100%, I'd like to thank the panelists for being here and for sharing your experience, please. And thank you for sharing your culture, um, the culture that you are a part of, that you um, have been moving forward and also have contributed greatly to um, in its sus sustaining and um, preserving here in New Orleans. Um, so there's, there's a lot definitely to, to ruminate about and to think about. Um, especially when we think about what that means uh, for us as a design community. Um, obviously, there are a lot of different roles that each of you had to play in order for this to uh, become realized as a physical place. And so we thank you for lending your hand um, in doing so. Um, I'll just say also another thank you to National Building Museum for allowing us to share this story here um, and to share the story of this building and what happens inside and all around and the streets that surround it. Uh, thank you to uh, ASLA um, for continuing to partner and, 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 and strengthen the narrative behind um, landscape, urban landscapes um, and cultural landscapes as well. And of course, thank you to Black uh, Landscape Architects Network um, for lending us two of their board members 
or I guess three, <laughs> and also um, for continuing uh, the work um, in elevating um, the voices, uh, the leaders around um, uh, historically and, and currently uh, Black spaces, places, and people and program. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over uh, to our partners at National Building Museum. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Ujiji. And of course, um, this could not have happened without your participation and uh, the participation of Lisa Jennings at ASLA, um, Professor Austin Allen, uh, Matt Williams, Chief Cal uh, Cosby, and um, all of you for uh, joining us tonight and providing us with your great questions and just learning and listening with us. Um, we look forward to the next uh, uh, program in this series um, and stay tuned for that uh, when we announce it uh, online. Um, but for now, thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you. And uh, just to add one more thing, if you are interested in supporting National Building Museum, if you are interested in supporting ASLA, if you are interested in supporting the Mardi Gras Indian Cultural Campus and Council, um, all of that information is available on the invitation that you signed up um, to enter into this webinar. So please consider, um, please consider donating, please consider uh, sharing this uh, session um, and any other session that we will be promoting. Uh, it is very important that we continue to invest in some of our, in, in these very special cultural moments and uh, preservation projects. This is not just a, a, a development. This is, this is part of a livelihood and a culture that needs to be sustained. Um, so if you like what we're doing, please let us know, tell your friends, but also please be uh, consider opening your wallets as well. So thank you so much. That's great. Uh, great. You took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> um, uh, I will also note that um, this program is being recorded and we will make it available on our website uh, in a few weeks, uh, in a few days, I should say. Um, and you'll be able to uh, uh, view it on your leisure. So um, until then, thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Mm -hmm.